Thank you, OCF. Good morning to you all. Bless Lord's Day to you all. Amen. That'll work. That, that, that'll work. Greetings from your brothers and sisters at Reformed Church of Los Angeles in the city of Linwood, as well as Wilmington. I'm really grateful to be back here with you all once again. It's been about nine months, like Brandon said, since I was here last, and I'm thankful that I'm able to worship with you this morning, to bring God's word to you this morning, to partake of the Lord's Supper together. Amen. Anybody spiritually famished and need the bread and wine? I'm sorry, juice, right? I don't want to start an upheaval here, right? Um, to spiritually nourish us in the Lord. Amen. I also want to give you an update, as Brandon said, as to what's happening with us. Um, check this out. In Linwood, Wilmington, San Bernardino, Orange County, Phoenix, and Chicago. That's a whole lot, right, since last, since last time I was here. In Wilmington, we've got about 20 people meeting for midweek services twice a month, one missional community uh, that is learning about Christian leadership, Christian character, and what it is to build a Christian community from scratch as we study and learn from the book of Nehemiah. We've also started quarterly, uh, quarterly prayer walks, uh, love baskets of food, backpacks for the next coming school year. But you know what's sad, though? is that our prayer walk started as a response. It's always as a response to something, right? To a 12-year-old boy being killed and a woman being wounded in a shooting that left a nine-year-old girl being struck by a stray bullet as she was playing on the playground of her elementary school. Sad, right? It's really sad. These are the communities that we're trying to reach with the gospel. A few weeks ago, on a more positive note, we ordained and installed four elders, four elders at one shot. Two of them were commissioned to the church we're planting in the city of San Bernardino. They've got a group of people there, about 25 folks. They've started a missional community group. They are connecting with their community by way of a laundromat ministry, meaning they go and they pay for people's washing, they give food away, they pray for folks, and they invite them to church, and they just did that yesterday. We hope to launch that church within a year. Our other two newly ordained and installed elders will be incubating in Linwood and serving in Linwood and Wilmington, and we hope to do that for the next 18 to 24 months and launch them within two years' time. But they've also got a missional community group where they meet once a week on Tuesday nights, and they too are growing in the grace, knowledge, and love of our Lord Jesus, as well as the leadership skills that'll take them to plant a church. But we've also got a team in Phoenix, Arizona, who's starting to gather a missional community. They're incubating at a local church. They're planning. They're prepping. And our other guy there is the chaplain for the Diamondbacks. Don't ask me how that happened, but we know people. <laughs> and in Chicago, we've got a group of friends who are considering relaunching or replanting their church, and they want to get connected to us. They see what we're doing in the inner city, and we want to see how we can help make that happen as well. Now, I wish I could just boast and tell you how we are doing this, that, and the other to make things happen, but the truth is we're just following God's lead. We're, we're preaching God's word, we're teaching his gospel, and we're loving on our communities in the, in, the, in the way that we're doing it. And the Lord is using every bit of it for his glory. So OCF, please know that we are very grateful for your partnership. Know that your belief and trust in us means so much. It's to help prayers and friendships that God has given us with folks like y'all to help us walk this path of church planting in some pretty hard places. You know, in Linwood, we're continuing to minister not just to Linwood, but also to Compton and Watts. Next Sunday, Saturday, as a matter of fact, we're going to be helping lead a prayer walk at Ted Watkins Park, again, in response. It's always in response to something, to a gentleman that was murdered at 9 a.m. in the projects just a couple of weeks ago. 9 a.m. in the morning. But today is Church Planting Sunday, so I'm grateful to have given you a brief update to all that's happening through our little church plant and how we're helping impact communities beyond our own. Remember, all the communities that we're endeavoring to plant in are in really hard places, what we would call the hood. You guys know what the hood is? Everybody knows what the hood is. That's where we're at. In Orange County, it'll be Santa Ana. San Bernardino proper is really bad. As a matter of fact, it was recorded as the highest per capita murder rate among California's largest cities in 2020. Who would have thunk, right? San Bernardino? Pretty bad. And in Arizona, we're planting in a small community called Maryville. But the locals call it Scaryville. And I went, and to me, wasn't nothing scary about it. We're used to Compton and Watson, South Central, but 
it's pretty bad to them, so we're going to go with it, you know? <laughs> and then Chicago is just outside Humboldt Park. So, again, thank you for your partnership as we endeavor to plant healthy, doctrinally sound gospel preaching and teaching churches in some of the hardest parts of town. You know, these places are super under-resourced, so it's by God's grace, and again, like partners like you all, to help us do what God has called us to do. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. So why church planting Sunday? Well, we know that by planting churches, we are being true to God's biblical mandate for us. We know that we are being true to the Great Commission, and in doing so, we are continually renewing the whole body of Christ. Tim Keller said that the continual planting of new congregations is the most crucial strategy for the growth of the body of Christ. So this morning, friends, I'd like to take us to a time when church planting was at its best. When churches were being planted everywhere and the gospel was spreading like wildfire. How about we go back to the first century? The Lord Jesus had died. He had resurrected. He ascended. And the gospel is being proclaimed promiscuously. And people are being saved left and right. You guys familiar with the story? What did we celebrate last weekend? That Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And we all said, amen. amen. Well, now what? What do we do after the amen? 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 So Brandon said, I can make myself at home. You guys okay with that? Because I'm going to ask you to participate with me. At home, we stand for the reading of God's word. So this morning, we'll be reading from Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. If you are able to stand and join me for the reading of God's word in body or in spirit, I would greatly appreciate it. Acts 2, 42 through 47. Let me get an amen when your Bible is in hand or your eyes are locked on the screen. Amen. 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 We we don't get through this, guys, all right? (laughs) And the word of God reads as follows, friends. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done throughout the the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. People of God, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord, friends. We can be really, really real this morning, right? And just like fully transparent. Yeah? Okay, for the one person, I'll be transparent. Everybody else, I'll have something for you guys afterwards. No, with all the brokenness in this world, Folks outside of Christ, they become hopeless. They become desperate, looking for solutions to the ills of the world. But the truth is, even within the church, we need to be reminded of God's sovereignty. That he's in control and that his plans far surpass anything that we could possibly hope for. And it's my hope, friends, that today, that this morning, we would be reminded that we are what God uses that we are used as his instruments of mercy in a broken world. Amen? Amen. So my burden this morning is that we, the Lord's people, would be reminded of who we are in Christ and what our role is in this broken world and how living out that role is used by God as an agent of restoration. We, friends, we, family, we, Christians, we are the called. The church is God's agent of restoration in the world. What does that mean? Someone asked me. I'm so glad you asked. (laughs) Check it out. It means that the church, us, is a group of people, not a building. And these people, Christians, us, we make up the universal family of God and are called to live lives that glorify him. Let me say that once again in case you blinked. The church is a group of people, not a building. And these people, us, Christians, we make up the universal family of God and are called to live lives that glorify him. Amen? Amen. We all in agreement? Great. We are called by God. We are called to live our lives in such a way that 
brings him glory. God didn't save us for Netflix and chill. God didn't save us to be wretched. I mean wretched. God didn't save us to keep him a secret. No, God saved us that we would be used for his glory and all that that entails. It means that we, the church, those called by God, must be the church at all times and in all places, especially in times of crisis, especially in times of need, especially in times of uncertainty, times of despair, times of hopelessness. In other words, times like now. I think that from today's text, we can ascertain a step-by-step on what the church should be doing. Let's go through the steps and see what the disciples did and what the end results were. From what we read, we can see that the church, that they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. That's a big deal. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. They devoted themselves to prayer. They sold their possessions, property, and distributed the proceeds to all who had a need. They devoted themselves to being in the temple, they, and day by day, they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, and they stayed praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And what was the end result of all that? What was the fruit? Every day, the Lord added to the number of those who were being saved. Now, I'm not saying if we do A plus B plus C is going to equal D all the time. No. God doesn't save people based off what we do, right? We all on the same page? God doesn't save people based on what we do, but he does, in fact, use us to draw his people in. He does, in fact, use us to help save his people. He does, in fact, use us for his purposes and the expansion of his kingdom. God uses his church, us, his called out ones to preach and teach his word, to live holy lives dedicated to serving Christ the risen king. Amen? God uses his church to bring hope into a hopeless world. God uses his church to bring good news in the midst of so much bad news. God uses his church to bring peace in the midst of turmoil. God uses his church to do all the work that all that entails. A question to the church, a question to all of those of us who are professing believers of the risen Christ that we said amen to last week. Can I ask you a question? I'm going to ask anyways. What are you doing right now? What are you doing? The platform may have changed, but the message, the message and the mission remains the same. The platform may have changed from the first church, but the mission and the message remains the same. We may have to get creative, We may have to roll with the punches when we see people who are hurting. We don't just say, I'm going to pray for you, brother. Yes, pray for them by all means. But if we see a need, we need to help fill it. And if we see a hurt, we need to help bring a healing to it. Amen? Amen. People don't care about what you got to say until they know that you care. People don't care what you have to say until they know that you care. We can have a theological lock and understanding on everything, but until we can get passionate as the first church did, until we can say we're devoted to things like like to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer, until we are devoted to really going out of our way to help fill the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ, until we are devoted to meeting in the temple day by day, breaking bread in people's homes, is it realistic to think that God will add the numbers to those being saved the way he did back then. Is is it realistic to think so that we can just chill, navigate on cruise control, and think all kinds of amazing things are going to happen and just kind of like, hey, God, you're sovereign. You make it happen. Friends, the church cannot be apathetic and think that someone else will take care of it. The church cannot assume and, and think by throwing a check at something, it'll go away. Checks are good, but it takes more than that. If I can be really real with you, it takes discomfort. It takes discomfort. It takes sharing difficult truths sometimes. It takes loving on the unlovable sometimes. It takes really going after the lost. It takes us wanting to be so much like Christ that we'll obey him even when it's not cool. 
Friends, the church is God's agent of restoration in a broken world. How are we collectively living into this role? How are you doing this as an individual? How are you helping make a difference? Prayer is good. Prayer is great. But at some point and some time, the church needs to roll up their sleeves and get to it. We can't wait expectantly for somebody else to do what we can easily do ourselves. Here's why I want to break this down today. You with me? In verses 42, we'll see this, that the early church was devoted to studying, learning, and prayer. The early church was, stu- was devoted to studying, learning, and prayer. 44 through 45, we'll see that the early church devoted itself to caring for one another. And in 42, 46, and 47, we'll see that the early church devoted itself to deep fellowship. And we'll see what that's about. Let me read to you verse 42 once again. The early church was devoted to studying, learning, and prayer. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. What we see here clearly is that the early church was what? They were devoted. They were devoted, meaning that they, that they gave all or a large part of their income or resources to studying the word of God and to prayer. Did y'all catch that? It wasn't a Sunday thing. It was an everyday thing. They were devoted. That's what they did. Oh, and fellowship too. I'm not talking about the kind of fellowship that involves punch and cookies, although punch and cookies are really good. You couldn't tell by looking at me. They're really, really good. But I'm talking about true sacrificial fellowship, the kind that costs us something. R. Kent Hughes said this about true fellowship. He said, fellowship costs something in the early church. Fellowship is not just a sentimental feeling of oneness. It is not punch and cookies. He he and I were thinking the same thing. Fellowship comes through living. True fellowship costs. So many people never know the joys of Christian fellowship because they have never learned to give themselves away. We will only have fellowship, we will have fellowship only when we make it a practice to reach out to others and give something of ourselves. It is also said that the early church took the Lord's Supper super seriously, as as we should as well, and as we will at the conclusion of the service. One of my seminary profs said this, that, that in communion, the Lord Jesus Christ offers his own person. He offers his very presence to his people, those who are hopelessly incomplete without him. In hope, God's people enjoy a foretaste of heavenly manna, a taste that deepens our hunger and focuses our desires on the kingdom that only Jesus Christ can bring. Amen? The early church was devoted to studying, learning, and prayer. But they were also devoted to caring for one another deeply. Listen to verses 44 and 45 again. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. The church outdid themselves in making sure that the needs of their fellow brothers and sisters were being met to the point that they'd sell their possessions to ensure that no one would go without. Now, I want to make sure that you're not hearing what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that in order to prove that you love someone, you must go and sell your property. But on the flip side, what are you willing to do to help meet the needs of those in the church? I would say that OCF, what is it doing? It's helping to support church planters and going in areas that nobody else is going. Y'all with me? That's a real question, one that should make us stop, reflect, and dig deep into our hearts. What are we actually willing to do? What is the cost you're willing to pay? We talk a lot about giving joyfully, generously, and sacrificially, not just money, but our time, right? Our talents and our treasures. We need to be able to give until it hurts. I'm not talking just about money, okay? Giving of ourselves, of our time. We can live in a, we're living in a world where we're just so consumed that our plates are full. It's like we're spinning seven plates at the same time, hoping that none of them crash and break on the ground. But we never can take away from God what he has already given us. We give to him joyfully, generously, and sacrificially of our time, our talents, and our treasures. We give until it hurts. Sometimes it kills us 
to be able to be nice to someone who just gets on our last nerves. Sometimes it takes just being nice to someone, right, to show that we are also devoted to caring for one another. What are you willing to sacrifice and to what lengths are you willing to go to help be that agent of change, of restoration that I talked about in a broken world? Our collective prayer should be that, that we'd be something so different that when the non-believing world sees us, when they see how we interact with each other, when they see how we look out for each other's needs, that they too would want the same. That they so desire to be a part of this community and learn why we are at peace when so much is going wrong. And when they ask us, how is this so? We point them to the Prince of Peace himself that we just sang about a few minutes ago. Amen? And friends, the early church also devoted itself to deep fellowship. Let me remind you again, verses 42, 46, and 47, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking of bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Here's the best part. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So, now that we know what true Christian fellowship is, now that we've gone back and been reminded what the early church did and how God responded, why not try to follow them? Why, why not try to imitate them and do what they did? Because we know that, that fellowship is costly. Because we know that it's not easy, we can sometimes try to hold back and let somebody else do the fellowship. Let somebody else worry about the needs of other people. Sometimes we can want to avoid sacrifice, but it's like, didn't we just remember that Christ sacrificed about seven, eight days ago? Nine days ago? My math is a little off. Be patient with me, okay? Three plus seven, ten days. My bad. Listen to what one commentary says. He says that within the community, there was a spirit of rejoicing and generosity. We're talking about the early church. They ascribed all glory to God, and their numbers were constantly increased as more and more believers in Jesus were added by him to the faithful remnant. Isn't that what we want? That more and more people would come to know the beautiful gospel message that we know, that Christ came to save sinners like us? In other words, they didn't just meet formally in the temple. They also met informally in each other's homes to eat meals. The Mexican standard version of the Bible doesn't say break bread. It says they ate tacos. <laughs> you don't know about the Mexican standard version of the Bible, right? What do you think the possibilities would be if we were to take on the very same steps the early church did? What type of impact do you think that we could have on the world by imitating the first church? Think about that for a second. Every day... The Lord added to their number those who were being saved. What a great evangelism tool, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to do, tell folks about Jesus? Not just in word, but that they'd see that we actually believe what we're saying. That we actually have skin in the game. Like, hey, I think that guy believes what he's saying because he's kind of living it out. And that's how the church, God's called, become an agent of change of restoration in a broken world. Friends, can, can we continue to carry on what has always worked? We don't need gimmicks. We don't need games. We just give them the pure, unadulterated gospel. We, we teach it, we preach it, we share it, we pray it, we sing it, we confess our sins, and we're reminded that in Christ we're forgiven. We break bread. We hang out with each other in each other's homes. We get to know what's happening in each other's lives. And, and when we see that there's a need, we help fill it. When we see there's a hurt, we help bring healing to it. So let's talk about what, what that looks like for us today. Not just during COVID, but, but all the time. I said we were going to be real, right, and be 100% transparent. What does it look like for us now when, when laws are coming out? that bring confusion as to when it's okay to have an abortion, not that it would ever be okay. Is it three months into it, 28 days before, 28 days afterwards? It's all wrong. 
Confusing times and wording for evil laws that decriminalize these things. Confusing times when laws have to be made to keep schools from teaching our young children about alternate sexuality. What does it look like for us as followers of Jesus who are still dealing with the COVID aftermath? I've got some suggestions of things that we can do. How to honor God, how to give him glory, and be used by him that that he would add to the numbers of those who are being saved. Amen? Anybody want to take these suggestions with me? Great. This, friends, is how God uses his church as an agent of change, an agent of restoration in a broken world for his glory. And the first is this. Take this as a challenge. Devote yourselves to the things of God. Devote yourselves to the things of God. The early church, they were devoted to prayer, to fellowship, to learning. They they were devoted to God. Day by day, they were doing these things together in each other's homes. Remember always what the first church did constantly and what the results were. Study the word. Be involved with sacrificial fellowship where it costs something. Remember to partake of the Lord's Supper and never stop praying. James 4.17 says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do, for him it is sin. We know that there's things that need to be done. Let's not take a step back and let somebody else do it. Let's be the ones to roll up our sleeves and say, Hey, coach, I'm ready. Put me in. How, How can I help? Right? Don't do it when you've got free time. Don't do it if you're bored. And please don't do it out of obligation. God knows what's in our heart. We can't fool God. Devote ourselves to the things of God. Amen? Are you all with me? Brandon, make note. Everybody's with me, okay? We're all on the same page. And the second thing, friends, is this. Devote ourselves to caring for others. Not just the ones we like. Not just the ones who look like us, talk like us, eat the same kind of food as us, right? Devote ourselves to caring for others. Galatians 6.10 says, So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And especially to those who are the household of faith, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Look out for one another. Care for each other. Really hope for the best of people and encourage them. We can easily become haters when we see good things happening to people or for people, and instead of giving God thanks and glory, we can ask God, why not me? Let's be happy for people when they're doing well. Let's really cheer people on and affirm them when they're doing good things. It's not a good attitude to have when we hate on people because things are happening for us. Let us truly devote ourselves to caring for others. Now, if you're asking how are you supposed to know people's needs, it's simple. Let's go to the third suggestion. Make sure to do life with each other, not just on Sundays. Make sure to do life with each other all the time not just on Sundays. 1 Peter 1.9 says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Invite someone out for coffee. Invite someone over for dinner. You can invite me. Get to know each other outside of our Sunday gatherings. Get to know each other's stories. And by doing so, you'll get to know their needs, their hurts, their struggles and trials, and how you can pray for them or bless them. Listen to Romans 12.10. It says this about the marks of a true Christian. It says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Amen? Make sure to do life with each other, not just on Sundays. And the last one is this, friends. Welcome in those the Lord adds to our numbers that are being saved. Let's welcome them in. As the unbelieving world is hopeless, they can see that we are actually hopeful. When the unbelieving world is trying to figure it all out, we can share our peace because we roll with the one who knows all things. Amen? We can share our peace when when they ask, why are you so at peace when the world's falling apart? Because I know Jesus. You got a few minutes? Let me tell you about him. When the unbelieving world is trying to figure it all out, we can share the peace that we have because we roll with the one who knows it all. Romans 10.30, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Well, for most people, not me. (laughs) One of the best feelings in the world, friends, 
one of the best feelings in the world is knowing that you belong. It's one of the best attractions that gang members have, I've been told. They belong and are willing to die or catch a case for one of their homies. We can't let the gangs outdo the folks, the people of God, in welcoming in those whom the Lord is saving. We can't let the gangs outdo the church in making folks feel like they belong. Christ died for his bride, and we, friends, we are his bride. We need to make sure we welcome in those folks that the Lord draws in because they will come. They will come. They become our family, literally blood-related, because Christ's blood has been shed for his people, those who would trust in him and in him alone for their salvation. We, the church, we do things differently, and that's exactly how and why the Lord will use us to be his agents of change and restoration in a broken world. We point folks to him because with God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. Let us continue to plant churches together. Let us continue to support church planting efforts and that God would use our efforts to reach his people, that the lost would be found, that their hurting would be consoled like a soothing salve to those who are perishing. Amen? Let's pray, friends.